there's a song that we sang a couple weeks ago that was written by Lanny Wolf. Do you remember that? And they said that he graduated from the Ohio State University. You know, uh, he holds about the three or four degrees. Uh, and uh, the reason that he went back was because he wanted to write music for the Lord. And uh, so he ended up getting a degree in music. And uh, a lot of you know I have my degree in music too, but he based this song on Genesis 28, 16, when Jacob realized at Bethel that Jesus was there with him. And I think in this world, you know, uh, we were just talking this morning, Betty, when you get up in the morning, you go in your living room, you open your Bible, and you let God speak to you. I love that, because that's what we do at our house. And we've done that a long time. And I would really love to just have a verse and then just write a hymn, you know, or a chorus. I would love to do that, so you don't pray about that. I would love to do that. I mean, I should do that. But instead, I, I, I guess I just like to sing songs. And uh, this one, I know you know this song, too. You can sing with me. Surely the presence of the Lord of events on King David. I've seen many pastors have done that, uh, but uh, today we're going to talk just about a couple of events that took place in his life just shortly after he was inaugurated as the king of Israel and of Judah. So we're going to go back to 2 Samuel chapter 6 verses 1 through 11. 2 Samuel chapter 6 today, and uh, we'll be reading verses 1 through 11. Uh, we're going to uh, probably go back a little bit from one of the incidents in chapter 5 and read that as well, but let's take a look at 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, where it says this, David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him uh, from Baale, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and Ahau. Have you notice it's Ohio, it's not Ohio. We just about made it into the scriptures, didn't we? <laughs> Ohio, the sons of Abinadab. And they were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahau went before the ark. I'm going to stop right there because we're going to kind of catch it up a little bit later. But I also want to run back to chapter 17 of chapter all right? And I want to take a look at another incident that happened even before this one. In verse 17, it says, When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David, but David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And David came to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me. 
like a breaking flood. Therefore, the name of that place is called Baal Perazim. And the Philistines left their idols there, and David and his men carried them away. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, You shall not go up. Go around to their rear and come against them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then rouse yourself, for then the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as the Lord commanded him and struck down the Philistines from Geber to Gezer. Father in heaven, we bow before you. These are marvelous incidents that I know that you can teach us some good things from them. And so God, I pray that you would be with us right now, that we'd be able to hear what your word has to say, and that God, we would be able to put it in a practical way into our own lives. So bless us now, Lord, as we look to you, for we pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. You know, I was uh, reading that there is a book by Christian Smith, and he calls his book Soul Searching. And in that book, this author summarizes the perceptions about God that are prevalent within our church and within the culture that we're living in. And he said this, most young evangelicals believe in what could best be described as, quote, moral therapeutic deism. Did you get all that? Moral therapeutic deism. He goes on in the book and he says, we could also call this viewpoint the Santa Claus God. I thought that was interesting. And here is how he describes moral therapeutic deism. Here we go. Moral means or implies that God wants us to be nice. All right? He will reward the good and he will also withhold from the naughty. Therapeutic means this, that God just wants us to be happy. And deism means that God is distant and he's not involved in our everyday life. Now, he argues, and rightly I think, that this is the version that is prevalent not only in our culture, but also in our churches. And then he makes this statement. Listen to this one. You see, so often our culture shapes our churches and our views of God. Did you hear that? Our culture shapes how we work within the church today and our view about God. I think he's right. I really do in this day and age. But our view of God should never, ever be dictated to by our culture. It should not. Our view of God must be shaped by God Himself. And especially, it can only come from the Word of God. What does the Word of God say about God? It isn't the culture that we should be following. But I am convinced that a lot of our churches have just followed that. And one of the most important attributes, I think, about our God something that we need to remember very strongly today is God's holiness. And I really do believe that a lot of our churches have disregarded that whole concept of the holiness of God. When we talk about what we're going to talk about today, how, God, how David dealt with the Philistines, and also how uh, David dealt with the uh, Ark of God coming back to Jerusalem, when we look at these two particular things, we should be able to see the holiness of God in a very shocking display. A very shocking display. The holiness of God is something that must be properly revered 
and respected within our society. Now today we're going to talk about King David. We could look uh, a lot of, at his experiences, but we're going to only see two today. We're only going to look at two experiences today that I think are very interesting in his life. Now, I want you to understand it took place at the very start of his kingship. This is the very first years of his kingship that uh, we find uh, uh, in David's life. Now, in 5 and verse 3, chapter 5 and verse 3, it says uh, that, that all of the king, all of the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron and made David their king. And, made, and David made a covenant with them before the Lord at Hebrew, Hebron, and then he was anointed over Israel and over Jerusalem. David was 30 years old when this began. He reigned in Israel for 40 years. When he first began, it says here in, in chapter 5, when he first began, there was a group in that area called the Jebusites, and there was also a group called the Philistines. And the Philistines knew David really well because he had walked in their ranks for a while. And immediately, both the Jebusites and the Philistines did not at all think that David was man enough to be the king of all Israel. They just, they did not trust in his leadership at all, okay? Now, we need to kind of remember that. He's just a young man here at 30 years of age. But I want you to notice what it says in verse, chapter 5 and verse 10. It's very important that you read that verse. Because it says, David became greater and greater. Why? Because the Lord God of hosts was with him. That makes a man great. Alright? Not how much he knows, how much he does, any of, those, any of those things. I want you to know it was not because David was, was such a wonderful person in himself at all. But he was only great because the Lord God of hosts was with him. And helped him in every area. Now, the first incident that I want to share with you today is like I said at the very beginning of his reign. It's, it's, it's right there in the front side. The Philistines, you know, decided, hey, we know David. He doesn't have the strength. Let's attack him right away. So the Philistines went up to Jerusalem to attack David and his army. And this is the first incident of great importance that came upon this new king. I tell you, you get into office and the first thing that happens is you've got somebody attacking you. Doesn't that thrill your soul? Well, that's exactly what happened to David. So what did David do? Well, the first thing that David did is he began to seek God's wise counsel concerning the attack of the Philistines. Take a look at chapter 5 and verse 19. Chapter 5 and verse 19 says very simply, And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? Now, David, you know, I am sure had a pretty good army at this point. And he had also a great heart. We know that. But I want you to notice, he did not, like other kings, rely on his army. He didn't even rely on his good heart. He relied only on one thing, and that was he relied on the Lord. And I thought it was interesting what the Lord said to him. Yeah, go ahead. Go up. Take him. I'll, you know, I'll get him into your hand. It's just like, well, Lord, are we supposed to go fight? Oh, yeah, go. Go do it. I think it's very interesting how the Lord put it. But then uh, we find that David went out, and, and guess what? He... He defeated the Philistines in an unbelievable way. The Word of God puts it this way. It looked as if a water flood had come and just literally blown the Philistines out of the way. I think that's cool. But that's the way God does things. Well, they ran. And I think it's so interesting. The Bible says here, I read it to you, that they even left their idols behind 
Now, in those days, they had these small little idols that they'd carry with them because they happened to believe that they would give them good luck. Even the army men would bring these little idols made out of gold or silver or something like that into the tents and into the camps where they were. They got so routed that they probably looked at these idols and said, boy, you're not helping much. <laughs> Give them a toss. Give them a toss. And later on, the Israelites came along and picked up all of these gold and silver idols and they melted them down and made them into whatever they wanted to make them into for gold coins or uh, into weapons, I don't know. But they, they literally spoiled the Philistines of all of their idols. Well, the Philistines were a little upset with this whole thing, so they regathered. They regrouped. And they came up, I don't know how long, maybe a year or two later, and they decided they're going to attack Jerusalem again. What did David do? Went to the Lord. He said, Lord, are you going to give them into my hands? And the Lord says, no, I'm not going to do that directly. I don't want you to do like you did last time. He says, what I want you to do is I want you to take your men and probably by night, sneak around the back side of them. All right? Sneak around the back side. Behind the balsam trees. I didn't know they had balsam trees then, but they, they must have had balsam trees back there. And so they did that, and the Lord told David, now listen, when you hear the sound of marching on the tops of the balsam trees, then go ahead and start attacking. But I want you to notice something very special here. When you hear the sound of the marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then you shall attack promptly. Then it says this, for then the Lord will have gone out before you to strike the army of the Philistines. Who's going to win this fight? God himself. He's going to take it to the Philistines. The Philistines were an odd, godly bunch of men, not doing at all what they wanted, what the, what the Lord wanted them to do. And God just was going to wipe them out. God went before them. What did David have to do? Came in afterwards and mopped up the big problems. All right? He kind of cleaned up after that. But I really like this. And by that sign, you shall know that the Lord goes out before you. Now, in the process of instruction, God said, you're not going to see me. You're not going to hear me. But... When you hear that sound, you can believe that I've gone ahead of you and I've taken care of the problem. David, according to verse 25 of chapter 5 there, observed exactly what God told him to do. Waited till God moved uh, and then he allowed his troops to move. But not until that time. You know, it's not hard for me to believe that God was trying to train David to depend on him and to do exactly what David wanted, I mean, what God wanted David to do. And I, and I, I, I tried to understand just exactly what it is and why this simple story was in the Scriptures. And you know, I think of times when God has simply said to me about something, just go do it. Just do it. I don't have to sit and wait on it. I don't have to sit and ponder it. I don't have to do any of that. I, I, I'm just to be, be busy about going and doing what God has called me to do. You don't need to think about it and pray about it anymore. You just need to go out and do it. You do what He's asked you to do. There are many times that that happens in your life. But then there are other times that God will give you a specific directive. And that directive will require patience and complete obedience on your part. Patience because God has got to line up a bunch of things, other things before you go and do what He wants you to do. God has a plan in mind and He does not want you running ahead of that plan. 
Now, if you're really seeking God's direction, you have to understand there are many things God must put into place before He moves you forward. He wants you to be totally dependent upon Him, even if it means that you're supposed to wait a while. I'll give you an example. I wanted to retire back in 2014. I really did. I was old enough, I was tired enough, and God says, no, I need you to go to this church and I need you to help mom. I need you to do that. It wasn't until six years later that God says, okay, it's time for you to back off of it. Six years. But in that six years, God straightened out so many things in my life that it was, it was absolutely incredible. Had I retired back in 14 when I wanted to, instead of waiting until 20, I would never be where I'm at today. And I know that that is what God wants. Sometimes he says, oh yeah, I'm going to have you do that, but not now. You kind of get what I'm saying here? You know, to tell you the truth, I'm really glad that I don't have to tell you how many times I wish God would have moved a lot faster than he did. How many of you agree with that? Yeah. 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 But when I look back at how he took his time to put all things together properly, I can now rejoice and be grateful that God worked just that way. You know, in David's case here, we can look at David's situation here as a very positive experience of seeking the Lord and following the directions that God had given him. That is very interesting to me. Yes, he went to the Lord, but yes, the Lord said, I've got a plan. Now, are you going to do it my way? It may take a little longer. But he says, it'll be better. I hope that you kind of understand what, what I think God is trying to say to us here. That there's a reason why he doesn't answer our prayers right away. There's a reason why sometimes he just simply says, go. There's a reason why. And God has it all in his mind as to what's going to happen. Well, I wish I could tell you the next story worked out as well, but it didn't. Now we have the story of King David. Oh my, I have to hurry. We have the story of King David desiring to move the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat of God, to Jerusalem. My wife asked me a question this morning. You know, well, why don't they have the Ark of the Covenant there in Jerusalem already? Well, because... When Saul was king, he took it out to fight, and it got captured by, guess who? The Philistines. They had it for a while. It was nothing but trouble for them. They gave it to another group. They had, a, had it for a while. Nothing but trouble for them. And then they gave it to one of the priests by the name of Abinadab. Get this ark away from us, the Philistines said. And so they gave it to Abinadab. And he had it in his house. Well, everything that he did was blessed of the Lord for the longest period of time until David said, hey, let's go ahead and get that back and get it into Jerusalem. So that's what he desired to do. He took 30,000 of his fighting men with him and they were having a great and wonderful celebration for this particular event. This, uh, this Abinadab had two sons by the name of Ahio and Uzzah. And they put the ark on a new cart and had two oxen pull in the cart. Well, something happened to these oxen. They stumbled and uh, looked like the ark was going to fall off the cart. I think you probably know this story. And Uzzah, the young son who happened to be of the Levites, he was of the priestly line, he reached out 
and he steadied the ark so it wouldn't fall off the cart. And immediately, God struck him dead. I think it's interesting that it says, for his irreverence. For his irreverence. What was he being irreverent about? You know, you and I look at that and we say, hey, wait a minute, that seems a little cruel. We don't, we don't always remember what God says about not only his holiness, but the holiness of his things as well. In Numbers, in chapter 4 and verse 15, very interesting verse, Numbers chapter 4 and verse 15, we find here that Aaron is covering all the sacred objects of God because it simply says in that verse, no one is to touch the holy objects or they will die. That's the rule. That's the rule. Uzzah reached out and touched something he should not have touched. He was of the priestly line. He should have known better. He should have known better. And then he died. Well, we know that that kind of canceled the celebration and the procession right at that moment. And I want you to notice what the attitude of David was here. He's the king. And it says in the scriptures here, David was very angry at God. Because of the, and I like the way it's put here, the Lord's outburst against Uzzah. It also says in these verses, David was afraid of the Lord. And it also says, David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David. Now, after Uzzah died, David's feelings about this were not altogether what they should have been. Let's face it, David should have humbled himself before the Lord right then and there. David should have confessed his error, acknowledged God's righteousness, and not deviated from the Word of God, because God's Word says... Only the priests were supposed to carry this ark. There were two ringlets on each side of the ark. The priests were to put a long wooden pole between them and carry it on their shoulders so that no one had to touch it at all. It's not what they did. Not what they did. As a matter of fact, David should have humbled himself, but he didn't. During this time, I think David must have fallen into that trap that all of us fall into from time to time. That we're a little smarter than God. Yeah, we are. Maybe David thought, what difference does it make? As long as it gets back to Jerusalem. Who, who cares if the priest carry it or if a, 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 a cart carries it with a couple of oxen? What does it make a difference? Maybe David thought, however we do it, it'll still work out in the end. Maybe David just thought that his way was better than God's way. Do any of you ever fall into that trap? Fall into that lie? Yeah, we do. And we do it continually. Remember what happened in the Garden of Eden? Because of them doing their own thinking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve broke the world. And we're still living in that broken world because of what they did. They thought it was a better idea. We always get into trouble when we demand to do things our way. When we start thinking we have a better idea, that's when trouble begins. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Doing what the Lord tells us to do, that's wisdom. Doing what we want to do tells you, guess what? You don't have wisdom. 
And yet we keep on thinking that our way is so much more superior to God. Let me give you some examples. Have you ever thought that you can spend more than you make and somehow your finances are going to work out? Or, or the strange thinking that we can permit ourselves to, to yield to lust and think that it's not going to hurt our hearts and our spiritual lives. Oh, I can do that. No, you can't. Or the crazy thinking that a husband can be critical and demanding of his wife and then think that his marriage is just fine. That's simple examples. But for some odd reason... We think we can do whatever we want and God has nothing to say about it. We think that we're that what we're doing, even though it goes against the word of God, we think that what we're doing is an exception to the rules of God. God will make an exception for us in this thinking. And I, I'll be honest with you, uh, our hearts don't always love what God says is good, right, true, lovely, and pure. Sometimes you don't think that God's best is really that good. And sometimes we think what God says is evil is really not that bad. And we can start thinking that if we're going to do our own thinking. There's no, no doubt that we can fall into this danger of thinking that we are wiser than God. Let's face it. That thinking is dangerous and destructive and it leads to nowhere. It never results in the life that we're really seeking or that God really wants for us. Did you know in the book of Proverbs 16.25 it says this, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end is the way of death. I remember one, one uh, very good Bible teacher told me, if you want to know what the will of God is, do the opposite of what you think you should do. There is no doubt that David messed up when he came to bring the ark back into Jerusalem. Because guess what? He wanted to do it like Frank Sinatra. I'm going to do it my way. My way. God doesn't put up with that. The procession stopped. The celebration stopped. And David had his ego kicked. Now, I'm not going to go into the rest of the story. Except for the fact that three months later, after this event happened, Finally, David got his head straight with the Lord and brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem in the way God wanted it to be carried and in the way that honored the holiness of God and treated God's holy things with reverence. Are we treating the things of God with reverence? I, I, I sat there while I was putting this all together and I said to myself, what are the, some of the things of God? Well, the church is one of them. Do we come in here reverently before our God? We're going to partake of communion this morning. I've had guys that tell me, I don't think much of communion. It's just bread and wine. I just go up and do it because everybody else is doing it. Hey, this is a sacred thing of God. This Lord's Supper. He is giving you His body and blood. No, it doesn't change into body and blood. But in a spiritual way, it is His body and blood. And you need to take it reverently and with great thanksgiving. Well, like David, guess what? You and I are going to fail as well from time to time. But you know, even God has provided for our failures. That's why He sent His Son Jesus to pay the penalty on our behalf. That's why... Like David, when we fall, we can go back to the cross. We can repent of our sins and we can get back into a right relationship with Jesus once again. You see, that's key. I think we need to come before the Lord today 
with gratitude in our hearts that we need to bow before him and partake of this sacred gift that he has given us today. And let's also think about the holiness of God. Let's also think about the place that we are at today. Because this is God's house. Father in heaven, I do thank you for the day that you blessed us with. Thank you for what David went through and what we can learn from this, O oh God. May your blessing now rest upon these words in Jesus' name. Amen.